good to see each other this evening. I ask you to take a hymn book and stand with us, and we're going to sing hymn number 494, Must Jesus Bear the Cross Alone. May we stand as we sing. Must Jesus to officially welcome everyone tonight. I don't know if we have any guests or not. If we do, you look awful familiar. Um, <laughs> if we do have any guests, I encourage you to tear out this little portion that's in your bulletin, fill it out, and drop it in the offering plate when the offering is taken. And uh, we'd like just to have a record of, of you being here and visiting us at Eastside Baptist Church. And uh, we've got a little gift for you out front if you're a guest, first-time guest with us. And also, we'd like to follow up. Uh, at least you'll receive a letter and maybe even an in-home visit just to let you know how much we appreciate you being here and uh, that uh, we were honored to have your presence here with us tonight. Welcome, everyone, back, and uh, glad that those who were here this morning came back. I know it had been easy to sleep in, you know, take that longer nap, so to speak, or get up a little bit later in the afternoon on a cold March uh, Sunday afternoon, but uh, glad that you're here. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we just um, praise your name. Lord, it is a privilege to be in your house. And, um, Father, I pray that we would enjoy not only the, the songs that we sing, Father, and the, the word that is brought, but just the fellowship of the saints. And there's nothing like just being together with God's people. And pray that uh, we would just allow your spirit just to fill us afresh and anew tonight, Lord, and just um, speak to each of our hearts where we are. I pray that uh, we would go away not only being hearers of the word, but doers of the word, Father, as you speak to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Uh, we're going to sing three songs next Sunday for our Easter, and that's one of them. So if you want to hear that song again next Sunday morning, I encourage you to come back. And uh, I think that's one of my favorite songs. I first heard that song, I think, back in the early 1990s when Steve Green, I don't know if any of you uh, Steve Green, know Steve Green or much of his music, but uh, he sang that song. It just has always been a powerful song as it talked about Calvary's love and, and just being able to overcome anything through Calvary's love. I ask you to stand as we sing our fellowship song tonight. <clears throat> he is here. He is here, hallelujah, he is here, amen, he is here, holy, holy, I will bless his name again, he is here, listen closely, hear him call. moments to greet your neighbor this evening in the name of the Lord. hymn this evening is hymn number 448 because he lives we will sing all three verses you may remain seated while we sing
just the ladies sing the second verse. Men, join us on the chorus. How What a joy to be here tonight and share with you and worship with you in the Word of God. I've been blessed already by the music. What a great uh, time we've had already tonight. I'm trusting that God will bless our heart through the preaching of His Word. In your Bible, please turn to the Gospel of John chapter 19. And I want us to read about the cross. This is Palm Sunday when Jesus made His triumphal entry into Jerusalem on that Sunday. He knew that he had less than one week to live. There was so much to do, so much work to be done in those short days. Every day was packed full of activities and things that he had to do before the crucifixion. Jesus went to Jerusalem that day knowing, on Palm Sunday, knowing that the week would end with him on the cross but the great news of Christianity is he didn't stay on the cross. They put him in a tomb. He didn't stay on the, in the tomb, but he rose on resurrection day. If Jesus did not really die, then his resurrection doesn't mean anything. 
if he was not really raised from the dead, then his death on the cross doesn't mean anything. But thank God, Paul says, he, was, he died, he was buried, and he was raised. So tonight, let's read about the cross in John 19, beginning just a few verses, chapter 19 and verse 19. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh or near to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. The story I heard some time back about a man and his wife who desperately wanted children had prayed that God would give them a child and Finally, God answered their prayer after 14 years of marriage or 15 years of marriage. God answered their prayer and gave them a son. And needless to say, that little boy was the apple of his father's eye. He loved him and nurtured him and loved him more than he loved life itself. The father operated the controls of a drawbridge. You've seen the bridges that would raise up and let the ships go through and come together and make a highway. This particular bridge was one that was a railroad trestle. And, and he would raise that trestle and the ships would go through. He would lower it and the trains would go across. One day when their son was about six years old or seven years old, his father carried him with him to work. The little boy wanted to see the trains and the ships go through. And so they were there not very long and there was a two from below and they looked and there was a ship trying to make its way into the harbor and the man pulled back the lever and the bridge raised and the ship went through and the little boy was so excited looking at the ship and the father was doing some paperwork, writing some things down and he heard a train horn. He looked, the train had rounded the curve, was coming down the road, down the the, the track and the bridge was still extended and as he started to lower the bridge his little boy cried out daddy daddy I'm caught and behind him the little boy had gotten his clothing caught in the gear and the mechanism that raised and lowered that bridge and that father realized that there was not enough time to free his son and still lower the bridge. So what would he do? Would he sacrifice his only son and spare uh, the lives of everybody on board that train? Or would he spare his son and let everybody on that train die? That man prayed fervently just quickly and, oh God, help me do the right thing. And it, with that he gave the tug on the lever and the Bridge came together and the train went across safely. And he turned behind him and saw the bruised, mangled, and dead body of his seven year old son. That's a poor illustration, really, of what God did on the cross through his son Jesus. But God gave his son, his only son, so that you and I might be saved. When you look at the cross in the Gospel of John and the other Gospel writers, you discover that there are several items around the cross that are worthy of our consideration. For example, the scriptures talk about the crown of thorns. Can you imagine when they weave together that crown of thorns and they shove that into Jesus' head and into his brow and as they shove that thing down in mock humiliation I mean he had claimed some of them said he's the king and say they said if you're a king you need a crown and they shove that crown of thorns into his head did you realize the first mention of thorns is in the garden of Eden after the fall of man after the sin of man Jesus, or God said to Adam, from this day on, thorns and thistles will the ground bring forth. So the thorns are a symbol of a sin-cursed earth. And they round that crown of thorns into the brow of Jesus. That's a 
worthy study, but that's not what we're looking at tonight. There is the seamless robe of Jesus. Scripture says that he wore a seamless robe that was woven from top to bottom. They took his clothing and gambled for it. There were several items. Maybe they gambled for his shoes. Gambling for the clothing was one of the perks, or, or collecting the clothing, one of the perks of the soldiers who carried out crucifixions. And so somebody said, you take the shoes. And another one said, well, I'll take his belt. Another one said, I'll take this. And so they were left with one item left. It was a seamless robe. And rather than tear it and mutilate it and destroy it, they gambled to see who would take it home. The seamless robe speaks to us of the righteousness of Christ. His righteousness and he shed his blood so that we who are sinful might be made right with God and, and receive his righteousness. There was the Roman spear. While he hung on the cross naked, they stripped him of all his clothing, hanging there exposed to the world, naked before world, the, the, the eyes of the world. One of the soldiers came by him with a spear, rammed the spear into his side, and the scripture says, out flowed blood and water. It's worthy of consideration to talk about the meaning of the Roman spear. Then there was the hyssop branch. The scripture said that the hyssop branch was used when on the cross Jesus said, I thirst. And they put that hyssop branch and put a sponge on that thing and lifted it up to the lips of Jesus. Did you know the hyssop branch was first talked about at the Passover? It was a, it was a tiny little bush that they would use to sprinkle or as an applicator type thing. And, and they would take that, that blood, that, that hyssop bush and put it in the blood and they put it upon the sides of the door across the top and down the side that night of the Passover. Later on when the tabernacle was constructed and there was the Ark of the Covenant, once a year the high priest would go in there with a hyssop bush with the blood of that lamb and would, with that hyssop bush take that thing and put it in the blood of the lamb and would sprinkle it on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. Their sins were covered for another year, but it had to be repeated every year. But on the cross, the hyssop bush reminds us that Jesus became the Lamb of God who was already the Lamb of God, but was on the cross paying our sin debt. Did you know the first mention of the Lamb was in Genesis 22 when Abraham and Isaac was going up the mountain and, uh, to serve God, to worship God. And Isaac began to look around. And he said, here's the wood and here's the fire, but where's the lamb? He realized something's wrong here. He's starting to get the idea that he might be the sacrifice. And Abraham said, God himself will prepare a lamb. Isaac asked the question, where is the lamb? That, answer, that question is not fully answered until the Gospel of John. When John is baptizing and he looks up and there's Jesus approaching. And John answers the question that Isaac answered, uh, asked back in Genesis 22. And John said, there he is, there is a Lamb of God. Takes away the sin of the world. Well, today I want us to look at the signboard. Would you... Notice with me the things that has, the scripture has said about the signboard, that, that thing on the top of the cross. Let's look closely at the signboard and see what the scripture and the word of God would say to our hearts. The different gospel writers describe that signboard in different ways. Matthew calls it an accusation. Mark and Luke says it was an inscription. John calls it a title. The truth is when a man or a woman, particularly a man, was going to be executed in Roman days, on his way to the cross, they would go before him with a sign, and on that sign would be all the things of which he's been accused and convicted so that all who watched this horror, there was a, the horror that was about to take place, they knew what he had done, what sins, what crimes he's committed, and they walked before the accused with the 
placard that was telling the world what this person had done. And then when he was placed on the cross, that placard, that signboard was nailed to the top of the cross and he was raised up. Everybody, every passerby could see why this man is on the cross, what it, he had done, what his crimes about, uh, uh, about, uh, against humanity had been, what his crimes against the state had been. Everyone could see that. Now each gospel writer gives a little bit different interpretation of what's there, but there's no contradiction. Matthew is intending his audience to the Jews, and so Matthew just simply gives the Hebrew translation. Remember three of those. Mark is writing to the Romans, and he gives the Latin translation. Luke is writing to the common man, so he gives the Greek translation. And John is writing for the whole world, and so he gives his statement, which is just a, a completion of all the others. And John said what was there was Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Would you in your mind tonight try to look at that signboard? Can you see the cross? Jesus is lifted up, and on the top of the cross was a placard, was the signboard of what he's been charged. Look at that with me. And so the signboard on the cross tells us three things. Briefly, would you get this down? Would you let this fix in your heart and mind tonight? First, the cross is controversial. If you look at what happened in this passage in, in, the John, in John's gospel, there was an immediate controversy that erupted between Pilate and the Jewish leaders. As they walked by and they read that thing, they were outraged that it said Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews, and they got a delegation together and went to see Pilate and said, don't put on there that he's king of the Jews. Put up there that he said he's king of the Jews. He's the rejected king, and, and they don't want it said to the world and to the passers-by that this is king of the Jews. That's interesting. Verse 21 is in present tense. Look at it. It really says, when they talked to Pilate, stop writing as though he was, was still being done. In the King James, it says, they said, write not. But it literally, it's in present tense, so they were saying, stop writing that he's king of the Jews. Pilate answers in, pre, in, in uh, perfect tense, and it simply says, this what I have written, I have written. In other words, he's saying, what I've written is there to stay for the whole world to see. I'm not going to take it down. Now, Pilate was a compromising politician about releasing Jesus, and yet he is unyielding about something as little as a signboard. Can I say to us tonight that we too are writing a story? Every day of our lives being recorded. One day we'll face God with what we've written on the signboard. We'll face God with what we've written through the days and on the pages of our life. For the believer, it'll be at the judgment seat of Christ. We'll stand before him one day. And, and Paul talks about this in Corinthians and in Romans and in some other places. Paul talks about what it'll be like for believers when we stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ. Paul says we'll give an account of everything that we've done, good or bad. It'll be revealed. For unbelievers, the reckoning day is called the white throne judgment. Read about that in the book of Revelation. Well, I want to say the cross is controversial, and it's still controversial today. Now, if you don't believe the cross is controversial today, try to put a cross up on the, the courthouse grounds, and you'll see if it's controversial or not. Try to sing a hymn about the resurrection in the schoolroom and you'll see if it's controversial or not. We live in a day when the cross is still controversial. It is controversial today and that's why we need to stand fast and stand tall and stand strong and say there's no other way but by the cross. I've come by way of the cross. It's a controversy and it won't be met with open arms, and it won't be met with a kiss. It could be met with a slap. The cross is controversial. There's a second thing about the cross and the signboard. It teaches us that the, sign, that the cross is universal. It's universal. Notice it's written in three languages. Hebrew was a language of religion. And it's as though God is saying that, it's saying that Jesus is God's final word on religion. Now, there are a lot of religions in the world. By the way, Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship with Christ. 
A religion is, is man's effort to reach up to God, but Christianity is God reaching down to man. And he's saying that my son is the final word about all the false religions that are in the world. And there are a lot of false religions around today. Did you know that? There are a lot of false isms and believisms in the world today. The question on the hearts and minds of people are, is this. How does one get to heaven? How do you get to heaven? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life, and nobody comes to the Father except by me. The cross is universal, it's, and it's a, it is universal, and because it's the religion, uh, spoke written in the language of religion, but notice it was also written in Greek. Greek was the language of culture. Well, oh, there are a lot of sophisticated, cultured people today, or at least they think so, but all true culture and all true civilization points to Jesus. I want to tell you that one may eat caviar and wear his glasses on a stem, but if you don't have Jesus, you're not cultured at all. Culture comes from Christ. Jesus refines the heart. Jesus cleans up and changes one from the rough way to a way that pleases God. It's amazing when you look at what the cross does and the message of the cross, how it changes one's heart and changes one's life and changes one's attitude and his behavior. The cross brings culture and meaning and reverence uh, uh, to, to life today. Well, I've got to hurry. It was written in letters, uh, the uh, language of Latin. Latin was the language of law and government. Now, what I want to say about that is I want to tell you Jesus is Lord Today, not just of the church, he's Lord politically, he's Lord of everything. Now, I know the world has not yet acknowledged him, but he is Lord. He is Lord, and a republic not, is not ruled by polls, but by laws. And it says to us tonight, law has become the standard of behavior for a nation. And if you take God out of our courtroom, if you take God out of our laws, we end up back in the jungle. We tell our children... Mr. Thors and I have talked about this on a number of occasions. We tell our children they evolve from an animal. Is it surprising then they start acting like animals? We tell our folk that there is no God. We say you can't pray in school. You can't pray to God. You can't sing to Jesus. And we tell them, why, do we, uh, why are we so amazed when folks act the way they do? Why is our culture falling apart, our society falling apart? It's because we try to take God out of who we are. We try to take God out of our society. Every law that's meaningful in our U.S. Constitution and our body of laws is based on the Ten Commandments. Well, the cross is controversial. The cross is universal. It's universal in its application. It's universal in its invitation. Can you see them on the cross and the signboard as people passed by? As well, they made their way into the city, they could see the cross and they could read the writing there of Hebrew and Latin and Greek. There was a universal invitation. The universal, the invitation is whosoever will. I'm glad tonight that God's gospel is a universal gospel and it's a whosoever will gospel. It is an insult to the grace of God for one to say that Jesus didn't die for everyone. I'm here to say to you tonight that Jesus died for everyone and whosoever will can call on him to be saved. I'm glad it's the universal gospel. If it required wealth, a lot of the world would be left out. If it required sophistication, a great part of the world would be left out. Name whatever standard you want and somebody will be left out. I'm so glad that Jesus said whosoever will, let him come. I like the story of that little boy who came to his pastor after the service one day and he said, Pastor, do you think there'll be any more of that saving business going on? He said, Son, I'm sure there is. He said, But I had heard somebody tell me that I may not be in the elect. What if I'm not one of God's elect? And that pastor said, Son, if you're not one of God's elect, he'll just elect some more. I'm glad it's a universal gospel. The cross is universal. Well, let me hurry. The cross is also personal. You can have a 
personal Savior. That's a phrase we don't hear much about tonight, a personal Savior. But he's very personal. Written on the signboard, when a man was being crucified, were his crimes, were his sins. Look at what was written about, what, what sins have, has Jesus committed? What crimes has Jesus committed? Look at the signboard. Look at it. There are no crime listed. There is no sin listed. Why, he's the sinless one. There were no crimes listed. All they said was, he's the king of the Jews. They could not charge him with a crime because he's the sinless one. He is a sinless savior. Somebody uh, once asked Jesus, about his life and Jesus said who can accuse me of sin who can point their finger at me and accuse me of sin I want to tell you there's not a man or a woman in this room tonight who could say that we all could be accused of sin and rightly so but Jesus said nobody can accuse me of sin Pilate said I find no fault in him Judas said I betrayed an innocent man the centurion said in the gospel of Luke Certainly, this man was a righteous man. The reason there is no sin against him, there's no crime on the cross placard or headboard about him, is because he's not dying for his sins, but he's dying for yours and mine. He's dying for the sins of the world. When men looked at the signboard, they saw Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. And then I submit to you, when God the Father looked at that signboard, he saw something different. When God from heaven looked at the signboard, he didn't see all that exactly what man saw. When man looked at it, they saw Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. But when the Father from heaven looked at it, he saw something different. You know what God saw when he looked at it? It's amazing how two people can look at one thing and see two different things. Or we can listen to something and have two different interpretations. Years ago, a uh, husband and wife were sitting on the front porch swing. The church was just across the street from them. The choir was rehearsing one hot summer night, and, and the wife was sitting there, and she was listening to that choir, and she said, listen, isn't that just gorgeous? Isn't that beautiful? And the husband listening to the cricket said, yeah, and they tell me they make that noise by rubbing their legs together. <laughs> you know, it depends on what you're listening to. It depends on what you're looking at. When God looked at that signboard, you know what he saw? Well, in Colossians 2, verses 14 and 15, here's what it says was on the cross. What was written on the signboard that you couldn't see, that man could not see? Colossians 2, 14 and 15, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, made a show of them openly, triumphing over it. So written on that signboard were your sins and mine. Every sin of mankind written on that signboard. Now look what it says that Paul said in Galatians. He says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Now two things there. He blotted out all the ordinances against us. In the, in the legal system of that day, in the judicial uh, Rome, uh, uh, religious day, there were ordinances. There were the, the original commandments. And then to added to that were ordinances or things that man had added to that. That's why Jesus said on one occasion, You have said... And he listens to things. He says, but God said. So they took what God said and added their interpretation to that. And that became as weighty as the thing that God himself had said. And the laws and the ordinances and the legalism that had bound it had become so burdensome, nobody could survive under that. There were rules and regulations about everything. If a hen laid an egg on the Sabbath day, you couldn't eat that egg unless you kill the hen. But if you kill the hen, it's okay to eat the egg. The hen broke the Sabbath. 
if it's winter time and you've got a fire going but the wood is on the other side of the room you can't walk across the room and put a stick of wood on the fire you've broken the sabbath day and i want to tell you men and women we have added to the things of god and we've made it so burdensome we've made it so ridiculous listen when the bible says in christ we are free what he's talking about all the legalism all the rules all the regulations that none of us could live up to the commandments of God none of us could live up to. Jesus paid for that. Although he nailed it to the cross and paid our sin debt. The rules and regulations, the laws of God, the legal, legitimate laws of God that we could not keep was nailed to the cross. You ought to say, hallelujah, he paid for my sin. If I were to list the Ten Commandments, just go down the list. If we just go down one, two, three, four, five, six, and we were to honestly have a show of hands, I believe in this room, probably every one of those commandments have been broken by folk in this room. I have good news for you on this Palm Sunday. All of your flaws and faults and all of your sins were nailed to the cross. Try, look at what he says. He said, the, the, the record, the handwriting that was against us, which was contrary to us, he took out of the way. He, he took it away by nailing it to his cross. I was preaching in a revival meeting near Monroe, North Carolina, just a few years back. God had moved in that, that whole week in a great way. and I think it's probably on Wednesday night. It could have been on Thursday night of that meeting. There was a lady there, very refined and cultured and dignified ladies came in and I didn't know her and I don't think she was a member of the church, but she was sitting over to my right and, and as I began to preach, that lady got the back of the pew and she started to stand up right in the middle of my message and I thought I must have said something to her that's angered her because she had this look on her face and she sat down and then a minute or two later she stood up, started to stand up again, sat back down two or three times, and I thought, boy, I've really angered her. And, but as soon as the, I gave the invitation, that lady left the seat and came to the front weeping, and she said, is what you said or not true? Did he nail all my sins to the cross? Has he taken away all those things that I couldn't live up to? He nailed them to the cross. I said, yes, ma'am, he took them away. And she burst into praising God. She says that I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. He's taken away my guilt and my shame and my sin. The good news on this Palm Sunday is he's taken away your guilt and your shame and your sin. It's nailed to the cross. That last line there from Colossians, Paul said he's triumphant over them. It literally means when not only Jesus died, not only did he nail our sins to the cross, that Satan himself was nailed to the cross. He was nailed to the cross and he can't get away. That's why he hates Jesus. That's why he hates this church. That's why he hates the Bible. He knows he's been defeated, and now he's on a long chain, and he can't get away. And every time that Christ is exalted and the cross is preached, Satan has a fit. You ever seen a dog on a chain trying to get loose? Just, I mean, just having a fit? That's kind of what Satan is like now. That's why in our society today, there's so much upheaval in our society. Satan knows his time is short, and he's pitching a fit like that dog trying to get off that chain. But I want to tell you, he's not going to break the chain that God's put him on. He's bound. On the cross... The signboard says the cross is controversial. The cross signboard says that it's universal. The signboard teaches us that it's personal. You can have a personal Savior. See, Jesus died for you. He died for me. He died for the sins of the world. Can I ask you the question tonight, have you made it personal? On this Palm Sunday night, I want to ask you the question, is the cross personal to you? Is Christ Jesus your personal Savior? 
Well, I know he's the Savior of the world, but is he your Savior? I know he's the Savior of those that will come, but it has, is he your Savior? He wants to be your Savior tonight. He wants to be your Redeemer tonight. I had the privilege this morning of baptizing seven people. What a glorious time that was. One of the guys that I got to baptize this morning was a guy that I grew up with. I've known him all of my life. Went to church with him when we were small, and I've known him all my life. We were in school together. He joined the church when he was about eight years old, but he was lost. Had grown up in the church. Folks look at him and say, you're, you're a good boy, you're a good kid, but he was lost. Sometime in his adult life, recently, and he's almost my age now, recently came to saving faith in Christ. And so he said, I, I, when I got baptized before, I was lost. But he said, I'm saved now. I want to be baptized as a believer. It's just believer's baptism. So I had the privilege this morning of baptizing Tommy. <laughs> had been lost, member of the church for many years. Finally got right with God. And he said, I want believer's baptism. So I'm standing there in the baptistry with Tommy. Tommy said to me, I'm standing there, and they were out there, and Tommy said, this is going to be good. <laughs> this is going to be good. I said, I'm talking real low, and I said, Tommy, how long can you hold your breath? <laughs> your wife told me to hold you down a long time. <laughs> I bowed to little Tommy, and he came out of the water, and he came up with his hand waving. And he said, I'm free. I'm free. Jesus died for me. Glorious, glorious time. Tommy made it personal. How about you? You might be like old Tommy. Been a member of the church for a long time. But you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. See, I said in the beginning of my message that Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. What is your relationship with Jesus like? Is your relationship with him the kind that it ought to be? So here's the invitation. Listen carefully. The invitation is for some of you who don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've been a member of the church. Maybe you're a good person. I don't know. But you know in your heart that you've never really been saved. You've never been born again. I believe the reason God brought me here and brought you here tonight and laid this message on my heart is because God the Father wants you to be his child. He wants you to be in his family. He wants you to be in heaven with him. And the only way to get there, see the cross settled all this, the only way to get there is by faith in Christ. Allowing him to, your, your sins placed on the cross and you accept the penalty and the payment that was made. On this invitation, some of you need to come around the altar. Let me pray with you and show you tonight from the Word of God how you're going to be born again. Make it real and make it personal. There are others here today, tonight, who know that you've been saved, but your relationship isn't what it ought to be. Your relationship is strained. Your relationship is not one that's go growing the way it ought to. Now, if that's the case, I can promise you it isn't God's fault. It isn't God's fault that your relationship is strained. Whatever the reason, tonight God is saying, won't you come home? Won't you come back into fellowship with me? See, he longs for fellowship with you. I wonder tonight if there's some who just come and kneel around the cross, like that lady there in Monroe, North Carolina, saying, you know, I'm free. The weight that I've been carrying, God has removed that weight from me. Would you come tonight and say, God, remove this weight that I've been trying to carry around. The weight of trying to work my way into heaven. The weight of trying to please somebody. And just rejoice in the relationship that you have with him. All the work is already done. Here's the last part of the invitation. We're going to stand in just a moment. We're going to sing. Here's the last part of the invitation. Listen now. First, some of you need to come tonight and be saved. 
Second, some of you need to come and just get close to the Lord again. Just renew that fellowship. Some of you ought to come tonight around this altar and pray for your lost friends. How many people do you know right now, just think quickly, that you know that are living and walking far from God? They're lost. They're unsaved. Or maybe they, they're saved, but they're wandering far from God. I want you to come and pray for them tonight by name. We pray for folks with sickness and surgeries. We ought to do that, not minimizing that. But we ought to pray for lost people. We ought to pray for those that are walking far from God. Would you come tonight and say, God, I want to pray for Job. Whatever the name, people that you know that are not living for God, just call their name out to God. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a son or daughter. Maybe it's a grandchild. Somebody that you work with. Somebody that you know. Would you come tonight on this Palm Sunday, just call their name out to God, saying, God, make the cross personal and real to them. Would you stand with me with our heads bowed in prayer? Father, thank you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the signboard on the cross. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. So, Lord, I pray that tonight men and women and young people would come tonight and crown you king, allow you to be king in their life, Lord of their life. Save some precious soul, I pray. I pray, dear Lord, that somebody who's walking far from you would come back home. Lord, burden our hearts tonight for those that are not walking with you that we would call their name in prayer and move upon the hearts of people tonight. May it be sealed at a time in this altar. I pray in Jesus' name.